We're gonna li we're going live. Here we go. It is five o'clock. It is five o'clock. It is Thursday, and I got David Smith and myself. <laughs> we're gonna be talking two forty eighty seven of the National Electrical Code. We got Nihad El Sharif. Nihad, I thought you were supposed to be going to Egypt, buddy. Or is that Saturday? You know, David. Oh, yes. I am losing track of what is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yesterday, I thought it was Friday. Today, I was thinking it was Friday. And the only thing that reminded me it was not Friday was this program that we're doing today. So I can't wait to be on this thing. I'm a long time, you know, viewer, first time presenter. So uh, <laughs> this is good stuff here. It's a real, it's a real honor to be with you. That's cool. So that's cool. So we got, um, you know, Nihad and I did a couple. We're going to have to get some more players involved. And uh, so so um, let's see. We got Gustavo out there ready for a talk. Nihad El Sharif. Ah, Nihad's not leaving till Sunday. So, well, at least I know my um, my, my uh, audio is working. I, you know, I got a different uh, different microphone. So anyway, David. Yes, sir. Smith. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's like, you've got two first names, don't you? Uh, sort of. Sort I mean, of. I have a middle name. So, yeah. have I told you why I'm known as David A. at the office? Have I told you that? Well, oh, wait. So, I know I call you David A. Everybody else calls you David A., but I don't know why. Why? Right. So, the entire point is that whenever I was filling out my applications online, to eventually join Eaton because who didn't want to join Eaton? Um, I, you know how like you can do like those Chrome autofill situations yep. and like you're just filling out thousands of resumes and all that stuff. And so I think what ended up happening was that I had my caps lock on for my first name and the rest of it just autofilled in regular, I think it's called camel or whatever, like first letter being capitalized, the rest of it is down. And so after I got hired on at Eaton, they just took all of that stuff and they didn't change the lettering. So my email is all caps David A, which is also caps, and then Smith regular. So it looks like you're shouting David A and then Smith. And so the first time Todd, Todd Lobman in front of the program, he just every time he just yells, David A, Smith, every time. <laughs> and so now it's David A forever and ever, amen. I have talked to IT about this, and they can't figure it out. So now... Uh, here we go. I'm just David A forever and ever. And I feel like an author, you know, yeah. like how they use like their first in, I mean, David Smith is not exactly the most uh, unique name in the world. So hi, everybody. I'm David A from Eaton. Well, why, well, so, so, uh, so you, when did you, so give us, give me some of your background. What's your, are, are you, your, your electrical engineer, right? Yeah. So I went to the lovely West Virginia University. I'm originally from West Virginia, went there for electrical engineering. And then I spent about five years doing consulting engineering, particularly doing you know, AutoCAD, Revit for higher education laboratories, K through 12, VA hospitals, things like that. And you know, the job before we did all, all the kind of stuff you do for universities or just around town, uh, 911 centers. So I was able to get a good sense of residential, commercial and industrial. And then went back to school, and here I am with Eden doing codes and standards. Nice. Which, I mean, who doesn't love that? Everyone who's viewing this is absolutely in the codes and standards industry for the electrical engineering stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. So here I am. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, we're glad to have you here. And uh, you're out of our residential slash commercial, right? So that whole division. And 24087 is right up, your, uh, right up your alley. And I know you wrote a white paper as well, which I have a link to that uh, at the channel. Uh, you also have, and I don't know if you got me the link to the inspection checklist, but yes. I have that. If you do have the list, then I'll put it up there. Uh, if I don't, then um, I will. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, we'll put it up later. I see Russ Safried's in the house. Cool <laughs> beans, Russ. Uh, so Russ and I are going to plan on doing something. So this topic is 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 very similar to, um, you know, we're talking about reducing incident energy as part of two forty eighty seven, right? So Russ Safried has uh, the chicken switch, which uh, helps you get out of the arc flash zone. So what we're doing and discussing in this session is basically 
going to hope, hopefully make that umbilical cord between his product, which opens and closes remotely a breaker, right? Uh, right. A little a little shorter because we're going to talk about technology and code requirements around arc energy reduction. Perfect. So we ought to have a good evening. So we got some smart individuals out there. We got Robert, uh, Robert from Omaha. And, you know, he saw my crawl space uh, talk. Space is space, not a room. Absolutely, absolutely. You got that right, Robert. So, um, and hopefully they'll be able to kick in on this discussion. So, 24087, David, is, is relatively new to the National Electrical. 2011 was the, what, what year did you start with Eaton? I started in 2018. 2000. So. 18. Yeah. Oh Good man, times. you're fresh but blood. But I wanted to start eating much, much, you know, earlier than that. But I had to build myself up to finally get to achieve the polo that I have on today. <laughs> you ain't right. You ain't right. So in the 2011 cycle, and we'll talk a little bit about the history as we get through, but it was 2011. I, I, I call it, I call it pretty historical outside of, um, Ground fault protection of equipment, GFPE, that went in the National Electrical Code in 1971. GFPE went in in 1971 and 23095 to solve arc flash events at service entrance equipment. And it wasn't until 2011 that we saw another code change that actually requires the installation of arc reduction technologies um, to address the, the same, if not the similar... Uh, issues that uh, GFPE was trying to solve in the beginning. So it's had some history and it's changed over time. And, you know, I think, I think, I don't know, it's up to, I, I think we talked about this yesterday. I think it was, we'll probably pepper in some of the history as we get into the program instead of spending that time up front, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the best ways to learn this kind of stuff is not only to understand the concepts and the terms and the physics of everything, but exactly how the history went about. You're able to trace back exactly what the code making panels were thinking in 2011 and on and on and on. And so if you have that breadth of knowledge, you're able to really bring a lot more context to you, whatever conversation you're having, whether it be in your local state, any type of IAI meeting on the site, or actually if you're a code making panel individual, you might be you know, coming into this particular um, code making panel for like an next cycle, maybe 2023. So the idea is to not only have this conversation here with us today, but also maybe look back on it and understand what they were thinking in 2020, maybe if we're thinking uh, 2026 and looking to expand this, why did they do this in 2020? Then we can talk about that. And so hopefully this document will have millions of views, not only today, but tens and hundreds of years in the future and aliens will find this <laughs> and all that stuff, right? That's right. When YouTube becomes... <laughs> Comes a uh, like uh, it's just yeah it'll go into the Library of Congress. That's right. right. There you go. Yeah. We're we're gonna be in in the Library of Congress. Yep. And and this will be sold on on eBay uh, for millions of dollars in the future. That's right. Yep. So so and then I'll tell I'll just say in 2023 and we'll talk about this. I think as we as we work down through the uh, the requirements, we'll talk a little bit about the history. Pepper that in. We'll talk about the 2020 code. What changed there? And also I think. Um, we, we've already done, panel 10 is completed last week. So we we know what the first draft of the 2023 code will look like, and we'll talk about that as well. Perfect. Now, incident energy is about current and t now. Okay. <laughs> I know we're getting, we're going to get <laughs> deep into this. And you know, um, current and time are two very critical factors when you're talking about incident energy. But if I'm truly talking incident energy, there are a couple other things that impact how much energy the electrical worker is going to experience when an event occurs, if an event occurs. And that happens to be the size of the enclosure and the configuration of the bus. So, right. Sure. Yeah. Yep. And so just to go off of that just a little bit, is like, so if we're talking about energy, current and time make up, if you t multiply those, you're talking about energy. It's energy over time times time. So what we are specifically talking about today is reduction of energy. You can do that two ways. You can reduce the current or you can reduce the time. Mm -hmm. As 
Tom Dimitrovich always says, right? So uh, essentially what we're also talking about is the phenomenon and the fact that circuit breakers naturally in their design, the more energy there is, the quicker that they trip, which great, that's what we want. However, whenever we're talking about clearing time and maximum arcing current, and minimum arcing current, which we will get into later. Maximum arcing current, everyone like kind of likes to talk about because that's maximum in it, right? It's, it's sexier. But the minimum arcing current is really what we're talking about today because it is, can be just as dangerous as maximum. It can right. be just as deadly. And so we are really talking about the current or the closing time of the minimum arcing current. Yes. Yeah. It's it's so. And to your point, we always talk about the mag. You know, the, everybody says higher, higher available fault current, higher incident energy. Not necessarily the case, um, because it's all about that clearing time. But, but the other factors which I don't talk about, because the National Electrical Code doesn't address, is the size of the enclosure is not a significant impact, but it does have an impact. The configuration of the bus. So when you're working on a piece of equipment. And I'm going to use my HP uh, calculator box for this. Um, wow. If if this is my bus and it's up and down, that's a vertical bus. We know that the arc travels opposite of the source. Right. So if my source is here on top and I have a fault here, the current is going to flow down and out the bottom. If I'm working on equipment and my bus is this way, vertical. Bad. Now, yeah, it's bad because now all of that energy is coming straight at me. That's and right. I'm not having that benefit of the energy coming down and then out. Down and out. We can make a movie about that. So, um, and we'd have to get Cheech and Chong or somebody. I somebody. think we are making a movie about it, honestly. <laughs> right You're now. right. We are screaming. making a movie. <laughs> So in any case, the configuration of the bus, the size of the enclosure, the amount of current, specifically arcing current, and the clearing time, those factors all play a role. But 24087 and 24067 don't focus on incident energy. They're going to focus on clearing time and current because the bulk of your energy can be reduced. If I can take that arcing current from uh, six cycles of clearing time down to less than a quarter cycle, I'm going to reduce incident energy. No doubt, no doubt about it. So absolutely right. Yeah, and also it looks like we have a chat here for uh, motor contributions. Uh, motors on high energy can be high if motors of high incident energy can be high. It could cause longer clearing times, which is uh, exactly right. Yeah. So we are specifically going to be talking about clearing times mostly today because depending on your system, you already kind of know a lot of the um, the miracles whenever it comes to the system, you know, like the current or anything like that, or how many motors that are on. So for maximum current, you would assume that all the of all the motors are on. What we're really looking at today is all the motors are off. Is right. what we're really looking at is for the minimum arcing current to because we're not necessarily talking about the maximum energy to make it so that the breakers are flipping as quick as they can. It's the possibility of not necessarily them being slow, but not being fast enough that there could be an event to where we just want to make sure everything's covered. And this is really what article 240.87 is really talking about, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Yes. And, and this is the parent text of 240.87 as it is seen in the national electrical code, the 2020 version and shout out to Felix Sandoval, a South American friend. Thanks for joining us. God bless brother. Okay, so where the highest continuous current trip setting for which the actual overcurrent device installed in a circuit breaker is rated or can be adjusted is 1200 amps or higher. This text drives a lot of debate and you haven't even gotten out of the first sentence. <laughs> um, I did a program the other day on that topic of of this first paragraph and and we're going to get into this but if you just from a 30,000 foot level understand that the parent text of 24087 is going to tell you is going to help you understand uh when 24087 is going to apply and then you have first second and first level subdivisions a b and c that provide additional information now 
you'll notice, uh, David, that we have 24087A and B shall apply. Now, we fixed that in the 2023 because that was a public input. What we forgot to do in the 2020 cycle, when we added C, C was new for the 2020 cycle, we forgot to change the parent text to say A, B, and C shall apply. That's a gotcha. Okay. But but inspectors and everyone knows that A, B, and C, you know, I, I mean, in my opinion, we don't necessarily need 24087A and B shall apply. We know that we, because it's 24087, you need to follow A, B, and C. So, sure. uh, but but we complete the sentence with that. So. so I would, I wonder if we're able to sure up this loophole here and tell me if I'm wrong or not. I would imagine the documentation goes into you would need performance testing documented. And so therefore, in order to get A to be uh, compliant, you would need to have performance testing, which would go on the documentation itself. And so you're picking up A, even though it's not listed in that parent section, I guess, of 240.87. Now, I know everybody out there watching this right now, and if you're watching this in the future, you have your book in front of you. Sure. And yeah, if, this is right. And I know you have your book in front of you too, right? Absolutely. Okay. Just want to <laughs> check. So in the documentation, in the documentation, it says documentation, and we're going to cover this too, but documentation shall be available to those authorized to design, install, operate, and, and inspect the installation as to the location of the circuit breakers. Documentation shall also be provided to demonstrate that the method chosen to reduce clearing time is set to operate at a value below the available arcing currents. That doesn't pick up, though. The um, I guess you could, you could, you could stretch it to see. I'm very flexible, so I yeah. would stretch it to that. Point. <laughs> I love it. You didn't know you were getting this today. You didn't know I love that. it. That was good. This is going to be my my first and last appearance on this show <laughs> yeah. it was fun everybody yeah. i'm gonna make the most of it for the next 40 minutes there is a delete button you know that <laughs> oh pardon me yep so um oh and so robert says explain how voltage plays into it please okay voltage voltage is the pressure if i if i relate this to water pressure my voltage is that pressure that's pushing the water through the through the system. It's pushing that current through the system. So as I increase voltage on across the same impedance, as I increase voltage, I will increase current, right? V is equal to IR. Yep. Now, what you'll notice is that in 208 volt systems, typically my... Um, available fault currents are high, right? I, like on a, on a transformer, the secondary of a transformer, my fault currents are higher than on the primary because the primary has a higher voltage. So as my voltages go down, my currents go up. And as my voltages go up, my currents will go down, right? Now, in the world of incident energy and arcing currents and clearing time, when my voltage goes down, on that secondary, my available fault current goes up, but my arcing currents are pretty low. Uh, they're much lower, and uh, and that's significant in the 24067 and 24087 because uh, on a 208 volt system, my arcing currents are going to be much lower than on a 480 volt system. Uh, and even though proportionally, when you think about the bolted fault currents and whatnot, but the analysis is the analyses or analysis is analyses that I've done. Um, it in the 208 volt systems, you're it's harder to get that. It's harder to get that current high enough to be in the instantaneous region. He says the voltage does not change in a fault. Only the current changes. No, the, um, if, if you have a fault, if you have a fault, like say line to ground fault, your voltage on that system is going to go to line to ground, right? So I guess, yeah, your voltages will be erratic. 
sure. your voltages are going to go crazy and your currents are going to go crazy uh, from a transient perspective and all that jazz. So your voltages are going to be all over the place, and, you know, in this, this, the voltage signatures. But yeah, you know, for the most part, I mean, if you have a 40 volt system, it's a 40 volt system. And um, it's the impedance of the arc where the current is flowing and, uh, and, and what that does to the current and, and all the harmonics on the voltage. So your voltage will fluctuate within the sine wave. Right. And we'll get into this a little bit whenever we talk about, or at least if we get to, uh, the IEEE, the 1584. I want to 1584. Make sure I have the, the, right. And so those types of calculations, I don't know if how in-depth we get into it, but you'll see how the math kind of turns out to where, where those particular numbers go and yep. where the danger areas are, which is what we're trying to mitigate, really. Yeah. And uh, Robert, I am going to cover rating versus settings. All right. Yes, so we what... are. <sighs> yes, we, we are. We're going to go over dials. What? <laughs> we are going to go over dials. Yes, we There's are. We're going to go over dials. Go we're going to go over dials. Uh, what we were talking impacted installations first? Yes. All right. So let's talk about, um, and, and the impacted installations, we're going to be looking at the parent text. So the parent text of that section of the code says any circuit breaker where the highest continuous current trip setting for which the actual overcurrent device installed in a circuit breaker is rated or can be adjusted as 1200 amps or higher. So <laughs> let's first talk about the actual overcurrent device installed in a circuit breaker. What we're talking about there is your trip unit, right? Yep. It could be a rating plug. Sure. So I could have a 1200 amp frame breaker. I could have a rating plug that's a thousand amps, meaning I can't go any higher than a thousand amps. Right. And so the overcurrent device that's installed in that circuit breaker is only a thousand amps. So this wouldn't right. apply. Correct. Um, the other debate that, that I've seen is around rated or can be adjusted. And I did a video on that, which I will, I can remember to do this. I'm going to link up above uh, on the channel so that you can go and see that. But that language was taken from 23095. Right. And I remember when that went in. We were trying to come up with, um, I think it was the 2014 cycle, if I'm not mistaken. What happened in one of those cycles, I think it was the 14 cycle, the panel got themselves into a sticky wicket because the 2011 code only applied to circuit breakers without an instantaneous. Right. And how many of those- That was the, heading, you... of the, that was the heading of the language, right? It's a particularly non-instantaneous circuit breaker. I right. Think that was the, the that title of the actual article in 2011. Right. And so, and so that's, that's exactly right. It was even in the title. Now, it was in the 14 cycle. And I remember having this debate with Jim Dollard, who was the originator of this. And I, I talked to uh, uh, Vince Saparita, who was on panel 10 at the time. He wasn't an Eaton employee at the time. And... He and I, I went around with him because I said, look, every molded case circuit breaker, every single molded case circuit breaker, there is not a molded case circuit breaker in existence that does not have an instantaneous. Yeah. Okay. They, they put it in there for what? To protect itself, right? So you think about a, you think about a circuit breaker, it has the hardest part for a circuit breaker is to keep those contacts closed without right. chattering under those high fault currents, right? Exactly right. So our philosophy is make it open. When the fault currents are high enough, just it's going to open. Let it open. So UL489 does not require, which is what we list circuit breakers to, doesn't require um, an instantaneous. And, and now insulated case. So insulated case circuit breakers are listed to, do you know what standard, David? Off the top of my head, I do not. UL 489. 
that'll be uh, year number three when I read 2021 goals. There Come we on. go. <laughs> and you just hit it because I just gave it to you. A mo- a, an insulated case circuit breaker is listed to UL 489. So technically, an insulated case circuit breaker is a molded case circuit breaker. And in fact, the UL oh, standards, sure. the only places you'll find the term insulated case circuit breaker is in company literature and in some NEMA documents. It's okay. not in yeah. a UL standard. Load center. Like load center. Exactly. Yeah, load center sure. is, it's a panel board. But, but people call a, a residential panel board a load center. And and I always struggled with that because I was like, well, what's the difference between a load center and a panel board? <laughs> Tell me where load center says it. <laughs> where is it in this document? I'll see yeah. it anywhere. I'd go into yeah, I'd go into the standard and 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 it's not in there anywhere. And I'd say because and what happened was I was at an IAEI meeting and someone asked the question, "What is the difference between a load center and a panel board?" And the gentleman who was presenting, I don't know who the heck it was. This was a long time ago. Gave a very good description of the differences. <laughs> and I'm sitting there listening. and I'm thinking, man, I did not know this. So I went to the standard, and there is no difference. It's a panel board, is a panel board, is a panel board. And it just so happens that we call it a load center. So same thing with an insulated case circuit breaker. What happened was years ago, I think it was Westinghouse at the time, needed a intermediate breaker before the power circuit breaker. They wanted a breaker that could hold its contacts closed much longer and went to a higher ampere rating than your standard multi case circuit breaker, which goes up to 2,500 amps. Sure. So, and the reason they needed that was when you're trying to selectively coordinate breakers, you want that upstream device to hold that, um, co- hold those contacts closed under those higher fault currents so the downstream device does its job. Well, right. in, at some point, you're going to be into a power circuit breaker. And when you get into a power circuit breaker, you're into a switch gear. Yep. You're into big equipment. So they wanted something that was not a power circuit breaker. The Goldilocks? Like Goldilocks, right? <laughs> they wanted something just, you know, this one was too soft. This one was way too hard. They needed something that was just right. And they found it in the insulated case circuit breaker. And instead of just calling it a multi case circuit breaker, well, like they should have. Mm-hmm. Hindsight being 2020, they should have never gave it the insulated case circuit breaker. They should have just called it. A 3,000 amp multi case circuit breaker with a 30 cycle delay up to a certain fault current. And, uh, but they called it an insulated case. Now, the power breaker, I call it the double wide, is the only one without an instantaneous. And, that, and, and, and that's what I told, I told uh, Jimmy and others. I said, look, 24087 only applies to the double wide. And you rarely see those in a power system because. It's literally a double wide. They're, they're two breakers side by side built as one because they separate the current into all these different contacts to make it easier to interrupt, to hold those contacts closed. They separate the energy like Napoleon, divide and conquer. And we hardly ever sell those because they're so expensive. That's right. So that's when they said, you know what? We're going to go to this language. We... Um, we settled on 1200 amps and we took the language from 23095 to help build the um to build that code language so tom just as you're talking about this whenever you say you settled on 1200 amps yeah where did that number come from <laughs> okay that's a mr smith you know, that's that's a that's a lob for you. Oh, I'm telling yeah. you. So yeah. this is this is how sausage is made when we sit down at the table at the code. Delicious. It's delicious at the end. And and just like a fine wine it just gets getting better. Now when you think about the National Electrical Code and requirements like this, you know what it takes to get a sentence or a requirement or a change in the National Electrical Code. Do you have any idea what it takes? What does it take? Two thirds. Ah, you need okay. two thirds of the people sitting around that table to agree to that change. Okay. And my understanding is that there are several different types of specifications or designations that each one of those code making panel members have, and you can't have more than 
a third or a half of all of those be the same type of designation. Right. Yes. So, so no. Yes. Yeah, so, go ahead. So you have you have you have like you said you have IBW there. You have NECA, IEC. Each one of those represents uh, IBW uh, represents uh, labor. Uh, NECA and IEC are electrical contractors. They are installers right. and maintainers. You utility. UL. Yep. You have the utility. You have the home builders most likely. Yep. Uh, you. I've seen. Oh dear. Um, I was just talking to him the other day. DuPont, I think it yes. holds a couple of spaces as well. Yep. Um, you know, American Chemical Society of Engineers, stuff like that. Yep. Um, it's several different people from throughout the electrical industry, not only the manufacturers. And so, you know, whenever you say two thirds, why did that particular number come about? Okay. And, you know, who decided of those two thirds? You, know, you see what I'm trying to ask here? Yeah. So, so here's okay. what happened. In the first draft meeting of the, I think it was the 14 code. In the first draft of the meeting, they changed the language because they realized that 24087 two, two only impacted a very little, very small amount of circuit breakers and that there are insulated case circuit breakers and molded case circuit breakers that are large and provide a delay that will have a lot of incident energy through. So they made a change in the first draft, which when you read that language, it would have impacted every circuit breaker down to a 15 amp circuit breaker would had to have had an arc reduction technology on it, regardless right. of its size. So I made a presentation to code panel 10 in the second draft meeting. And some of the slides from that presentation we have in our slide deck. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I said, look, and I explained to them the problematic issue with their language, which says basically they would have impacted every multi-case circuit breaker and insulated case circuit breaker and power circuit breaker known to man that would be installed. Right. And that that's very encompassing. And they were like, you saw the light bulbs go off. And I said, so the solution and the only way that I could, because remember in the second draft, you can't introduce anything new. No new material. No new material. So my options in 24087 or our options as a panel were very limited because we couldn't just scrap and say, oh, this is what we meant because right. it would have been new material. So why built off of a public input that mentioned an ampere value, I threw out a thousand amps in, um, in the first, in the second draft, I said, look, Make it the same as ground fault protection of equipment, a thousand amps and above. And we sat down and we and I I said look and I and I'll, we'll we'll talk about and I'll show you those slides. In fact, here I'll show them to you right now. I um I went Treat. through and said uh, here's here's all of these circuit breakers that we have. Sorry about that. And and you'll notice that these are the big boys. We want to hit the stuff that goes up to large, up to like, you know, 6,000 amps. Right. And I had hit 1,000 amps, but really 1,000 amps didn't make sense because you can't buy a 1,000 amp circuit breaker. <laughs> okay. You buy a 1,200 amp breaker that can be adjusted down to 1,000 amps, but it's a 1,200 right. amp frame breaker. Right. So they said, look, it's either going to be 1,200 or 800 or 2,500. There were some people at the table that wanted to take it to 2,500. The IBW and some of the contractors said, no, we want to take the 800. And they argued and argued and argued. And you know what got two thirds? 1200 amps. There it is. Right. So now here we are in the 2023 code cycle and panel 10 is now saying, look, remember that discussion? We're going to take it down to 800 amps. So the 2023. Great. Because Eaton with, our particular product line, to give a little bit of plug here. We already do all of the solutions that you would need for 240.87 all the way down to 800 amps, starting at 800 amps, right. I should say. Right. And so, fantastic. See, if you stick with us, you're cycles ahead. <laughs> cycles ahead. In a good now, way. Now, now, here's, now, 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 okay. So, the panel agreed they want to go to, to 800, but here's the catch. Okay. Because not all manufacturers have the solutions like we have all the, the ways down ones. right they were like 
they felt more comfortable going to a thousand amps. Okay, which I know I. <laughs> okay, I saw the light bulb go off in your head because it doesn't make sense. Because I have a twelve hundred amp breaker. If I'm on a thousand amps, I adjust it down. So that thousand amps really is already. Covered. What's the difference? Right. right. Yeah. So what they did was they said, okay, we're going to make it go down to 800, but they put a time delay on it. But I think even in the actual committee meeting, they removed that time delay. I'd have to take a look. In fact, I'll do that as we're, as we're moving along. But um, this is a lot of stuff here, by the way, we're not saying this is going to be in the 2023 NEC. That's, that's very much still being baked, but we're just live updating you as of December 17th, 2020. That is exactly These are the right. discussions that we're having. Yeah. This is yeah. just live journalism, right? This is live journalism. That's right. Never thought about it that way, but Capital you're right. J. It's not fake news. So <laughs> what, what, uh, from a, from an NEC perspective, the, uh, the code panel has their sights on going down to, um, 800 amps. It's probably right in the first draft meeting. It's not going to get there. I think we have a lot of potential, to, to get that decided in the second draft. Because you know what will happen? The other manufacturers will go back to their home base and say, guys, this is where the panel's going. And it's not hard to make the technology. It's not hard to do this uh, from a code perspective. So it'll probably, um, they'll probably be, hopefully come back in the, uh, in the public comment phase and say, hey, you know what, we're ready. Let's put a 2026 effective date and move it down right. to, 800 amps so and i would imagine if i know mr dimitrovich like i do he will have a live update of the first draft meetings as soon as they're done in the second uh srs whenever they're done and so if you continue to follow this channel you will be the first to know and you know what that means That's right subscribe uh, hit the bell subscribe rate and review act now <laughs> You ain't right. We got Al. YouTube's going to take this off. Too much fun. We got Mr. Teresi on the line, too. He says, actual in front of overcurrent is confusing. If the circuit breaker is only used for short circuit and ground fault, like a motor, this section is not applicable. Or is it related to relay protection, like a gen set with internal relay protection? So, you know, Al, um, you know, the, the a circuit breaker has a trip unit in it. And some of those circuit breakers might have what we call plugs. Um, and, you know, and every manufacturer is a little different. So um, it's it's the overcurrent protection. It's can it, you know, key in on can it be adjusted to 1,000 or 1,200 amps? Uh, all right. Oh, here we go. What is the typical reduction in incident energy when the requirement goes to 800 amp breakers? Uh, what is the typical reduction as far as uh, amount of incident energy? It could be uh, sig quite significant. I'm, we can run some numbers, uh, and I'll do that a little bit later. Uh, but um, so here's here was here, here's a big misconception. Um, I don't have. Let me. Do I have a one line? Hold on one second. I know we're going to bounce around a little bit, but we already talked about that. That's probably what we're going to do, and that's okay. So let me find a little one-line diagram because here we go. All right. Now, this panel, the incident energy in this panel is not based upon the clearing time of that overcurrent protective device, right? Right. The amount of incident energy because of line side propagation is really based upon the upstream overcurrent device. And the amount of energy is not dependent upon the size of that overcurrent protective device. Because right. if I have 22,000 amps of available fault current, whether it's an 800 amp breaker, a, a 1200 amp breaker, if my arcing current is lower than the instantaneous pickup, and I'm in, say, two second time delay, you know, I'm in the long time region. I don't care if it's an 800 amp breaker, a 1200 amp breaker. I have a lot of incident energy because of the amount of time that I have uh, will let that energy persist. Now, it doesn't matter how big your boat is, right? If you're on a, uh, a cruise liner or you're on a little paddle boat, if the dam breaks, <laughs> it's the size of the dam that depends on what you're going to be seeing, right? Yes, that's exactly right. So now if I look at 1584 and I have a, um, I have the latest, um, 
I have the latest thing. So and and Tim's and Tim uh, Crosher, you're 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 right. It's the same fault current, but it's the clearing time, right? So if I have a if I have a smaller, if, say I go down to 800 amps, and and let's take a look at before I bring that up. If I go to 800 amps, and we're we're definitely bouncing around here, but if we look at the language on when does this apply, right? If I go to 800 amps, I look at my options. My options are basically if my arcing current is in the instantaneous region, I don't need an, an instant energy reduction method because the instantaneous is the instantaneous is is the arc energy reduction, right? So that's right. So I would not have to do anything for an 800 amp breaker where my if I have 20,000 amps of available fault current. Well, let's do this. Uh, I'm, I have a spreadsheet. We're talking about the minimum, right? The minimum marking current? Yeah, minimum marking current's exactly right. We want to highlight that on this particular thing here, you know, right. Yep, so I have a, uh, a spreadsheet that is quite large. So I've got our power line 4X. I've, uh, it, it, I have, uh, I've got my working distance. I've got my, um, that's my 18 inches. I got my 25 millimeter of gap in the electrodes. I have the size of the enclosure because we said the size of the enclosure makes a big difference. I've got VCB and there are other configurations. There's VCB, VCBB for vertical with barrier, HCB for horizontal, and then there's stuff for air. I've got my voltage. Let's put my voltage back up to 480. Yeah, that's what we were talking about before. Whoever asked about voltage, this is where it comes into play. Exactly. So now if I have... Um, 10,000 amps of available fault current and my clearing time is point uh, so a typical instantaneous around 0.02 seconds right so if I have a uh, that's you know 0.016 is one cycle so a cycle and a half two cycles somewhere in that ballpark uh, so somewhere in here is where you're going to clear the incident energy is going to be around 0.3 to 0.44 calories of the amount of energy that I'm going to let through to that downstream very you low. Just, you yeah. just said the calorie word, right? Now what are we talking about? Oh, we're I know. about PPE, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, then, and that's going to help me. Now, if I increase, remember, it's a, it's 10,000 amps of bolted fault current. If I increase the time to two seconds, I'm at 29 calories. Okay? So if whether it's an 800 amp breaker, a 1200 amp breaker, a uh, 4,000 amp breaker, if I have 10,000 amps of bolted fault current, and my arcing current, my 6,700 amps is not in the instantaneous region, then I could have a clearing time up to two seconds. I'm up to 30 calories. And if I put an arc reduction method on, like say the arc reduction maintenance switch, which clears in about 0.02 cycles, I go from 29 calories to 0.3. So for, from a Tim Croucher's perspective, uh, and his question basically was, what's the difference? The difference could be huge, 20 some calories. 29 calories, right? So uh, it depends on the clearing times. Now, if I'm in a short time delay and I have say 0.07 seconds, I, I take it from uh, one calorie down to uh, 0.3 calories, which isn't that much. One calorie, I mean, don't get me wrong, you don't want to experience a calorie either. Um, now let's take the bolted fault current up to uh, 40,000 amps, right? At 0.02 seconds of clearing time, I'm at 1.17 calories. At uh, two second clearing times, I'm up over 100. All right, and that's at 480. Now let's change the um, let's change the voltage down to 208 for that same 40,000 bolted fault current value. I'm at 1.17, and I'm at still 116,000. So my voltage really, sorry, 480. My voltage isn't impacting that. Ah, you know what I did? Hold on. I think I wait. I gotta reopen this. Nope, don't save. I um. I I uh, I should not have done what I did. I I overwrote the wrong number. Ouch. Nice. Yeah. Good times. Spreadsheet fun here at Dimitrovich Five. There we go. Do you see how those numbers changed? All right. So if I'm at four eighty. 
And let's go back to 40,000 amps down here at the bottom. I go to 40,000 amps, 3940. I'm at uh, 1.17 calories. If I take this down to 208, I'm at 0.66. Now, here's, and you'll say, wow, look, my clearing time and my, 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 my voltage is at 208. So if if I had a if I had a trans if I had a transformer in it and had a 480 volt secondary, and my uh, it, my clearing time was 0 .2, 0.02 seconds, I'd, I'd be at 1.17 calories. If my actual transformer was a 208 volt secondary, my incident energy would be 0.66 calories, right? Right. But look what happens to the arcing current. At 208 volts, my lowest arcing current is 12.99. Okay. Let's put this at 480. It goes to 24,000. It cut it in half. Now, think about the time current characteristic curve for a circuit breaker. When I have a lower voltage, my arcing current got cut, went from 24,000 to 12,000. It went way to the left. I have a better chance of being in the long time region on that same, I haven't changed. It's still a 600 amp breaker. Yep. My voltage isn't 480. My voltage is 208. I can use a 400, a 6, 800 amp breaker on a 208 volt system. I can use an 800 amp breaker on a 480 volt system, but my arcing current is going to be much less on the 208. I'll have a better chance of being in the long time region outside of the instantaneous on a 208 than I will on a 480. Exactly right. So, uh, so this gives you a little flavor for you know what it will. Um, what it does for you with regard to uh, the amount of incident energy. So the size of that overcurrent protective device, whether it's an 800 amp breaker or a 1200 amp breaker, if your arcing currents are less than the instantaneous, you've got problems. All right, so let's go back up to this discussion. Rated or can be adjusted, and I do have a video on this, and I'm going to walk through it quickly. I'll link to this video, which I may have already done that uh, up above. Rated or can be adjusted. 240.6 is where we talk about the standard ampere ratings of circuit breakers and fuses. And, and, and as you know, in 240.6, we have the standard ampere ratings, 15, 20, 25, all that good stuff. And we just added a 10 amp circuit breaker to this table because of the copper clad aluminum efforts that are going on in the National Electrical Code. And in... When you have these devices that have an electronic trip unit that are adjustable, what they'll typically do to change the rating, because think about if I have a 1200 amp breaker and I only have, I only need eight, why would I buy it? I'm going to adjust it down to 800 amps. I'm going to put 800 amps worth of conductor. Why would I do that? Why would I buy a 1200 amp frame and put it on 800 amps worth of conductor? Do you have any idea? Tell me. All right. So let's think about it. Oh, I was looking for my water. It's right here. So <laughs> the, one of the reasons I might do that is because a 1200 amp breaker has a higher instantaneous pickup than the 800 amp frame breaker. Okay. Sure. And I might need that higher instantaneous to add more delay for motor starting for, uh, you know, say I have a lot of motors starting at the same time downstream. Possibly I might need that for selective coordination where I have a larger frame breaker, but I only have 800 amps worth of conductor. Now, what the code tells you is that if you adjust it down to 800 amps and it can be adjusted to 1200 amps, that's still a 1200 amp rated breaker. Sure. Unless you follow the rules in 240.6. And 240.6 says, if you adjust it down to 800 and you lock the cover or you password protect that setting, it's no longer a 1200 amp breaker. It is an 800 amp breaker. So now I can put 800 amps worth of conductor on that now 800 amp rated breaker. If I don't have the lock and key, then that breaker is a 1200 amp breaker. I have to treat it like a 1200 amp breaker. I can't put 
800 amps worth of conductor on. Make sense? It does. Now, if we go back to 240, and what that does is it changes the long time pickup, not the instantaneous. The instantaneous is exactly the same. That was our uh, ND 1200 amp breaker, uh, and it can be adjusted all the way down to 0. 0.4 times 1200 amps. And um, this is my, uh, again, the ND breaker. And that's the instantaneous. This is a 2000 amp breaker adjusted down. It can be adjusted down to 0. 0.4 down to 800 amps. So that's 800. That's a 2000 amp frame breaker adjusted down to 800. The instantaneous hasn't changed. What drives incident energy is not the long time pickup. What drives incident energy is where that instantaneous is in regard to the arcing current. Now, the guys on panel 10 who govern 23095 and 24087 understand that both of those requirements are there to respond to those bolt currents. And changing the long time pickup doesn't address the concern. So they added or can be adjusted. So even if you have that lock cover, it's rated for 800 amps because you've adjusted it down and you've locked it, but it can still be adjusted to 1200 amps. So what about or, a dial? What? What about a dial? Just it's 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 called dial a current, right? So so that so so that language and a lot of people so I was actually I was at a meeting. And there were two individuals arguing with me that you don't need 23095, you don't need to put ground fault protection of equipment on a circuit breaker that is adjusted to below a thousand amps and the door is locked. And you don't need an arc reduction maintenance switch if you have adjusted it below uh, 1200 amps and the door is locked, which is wrong. And I even questioned my own my own understanding of it. And I started call, making some phone calls. And I'm like, hold on guys, you know, am I, is this right or is this wrong? And they were like, not only no Tom, but no, you know, it was, it was, uh, it, it was, it's, but you can, you can run around in circles in that regard. And I did a, I did a recorded video on that one. So, um, and I'll link to that. So that's the first thing is you got to understand when you're getting into 24087. So I used this slide to help people understand what circuit breakers you're really impacting. And, um, and, and, you know, it's pretty much, and I, I won't say all of your power circuit breakers, there's still power circuit breakers that, well, not really. It's all your power circuit breakers, pretty much the, the, anything, everything can be adjusted. Um, so there's the, and we don't call them end frame anymore, do we? We have them as uh, we have our new um, power defense breakers out, and That's we right. don't use end frame, J frame, K frame, L frame anymore. We use uh, numbers. So I haven't updated this because people will still see these breakers out there. But that first one does not need an arc reduction technology because it's an 800 amp frame and frame breaker cannot be adjusted above 800 amps. But the other one, which I can adjust all the way down to 500 amps, because I can adjust it to 1200, you would have to have an arc reduction maintenance technology on it. And look where the instantaneous override is on it, 14,000 amps. And now these are the R frame breakers. Which ones of these would you not have to have an arc reduction technology on, Mr. Smith? I would go with the 800 rated, the first one up there, the, the 16. What's the frame? 1600. 1600. 1600 frame. And then the first 200. I'll get, pardon me, because the frame is over 1200 amps on all of those. Then you would have <laughs> all to right. Have yes. For there. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, exactly right. So those can be adjusted to greater than 1200 amps. So all of your R frame, at least that's what we call them. The frame numbers are not consistent between manufacturers. There's nothing in UL that talks, this is all marketing. Eaton elected to have, call there's an R frame and, and elected to have these, this R frame have be comprised of the 16, 2000 and 2500, right? And the, 
N frame and the uh, L frame and K frames. So everybody else calls there something different. Your power and insulated key circuit breakers, same way. These guys are big boys, very high instantaneous. They are designed to hold those contacts closed. I, I don't, you know, regardless of what they are, they're going to be able to be adjusted. Now, here's where some power circuit breakers will have what they call a plug. Where you pop out the plug, you pop in a lower rated plug. And this gets to the parent text that says, is installed. And what that's speaking to is when I take that 3000 amp frame or 2000 amp frame and I put a 1000 amp plug in there, that means that that breaker, without replacing the plug, without shutting it down, pulling that thing out, unscrewing it, pulling it out, putting in a higher rated plug and then taking it to a higher number, that's almost, that's very similar to saying, okay, I'm going to take a fuse out of my 1200 amp switch. There's an 800 amp fuse. I'm going to shut it down, take that fuse at 800 amp fuse out and put a 1200 amp fuse in. Right. Right. So it's very similar to that. And, um, and we don't have to have an arc reduction technology on a 1200 amp switch with an 800 amp fuse. Right. So same deal here. This is a 12, this could be a 1200 amp frame, but the plug rating might be something less. So that's the sort of the, the bottom line. It, so what gets you into 240.87, you're going to be looking at, can I adjust it? Forget about the rating, forget about 240.6 and whether or not you have the lock cover. Can it be adjusted to 1200 amps or above? And... What's the other one? Uh, is there a plug, right? There's no mention of voltage, or is there? This is this a trick question? Where's 24087 in chapter 240? What part is it in? Let's check. Anybody out there in tube land? What part is 24087 in? Number seven for circuit breakers. Number seven. Now, let me ask you, and I've had this question, and I all, you know, it's one of those things where you, here's what I've learned. I'm going to give this advice to you, David. When someone asks you, when a, especially a guy like Al Teresi or a guy like Tim Crouch or, or Robert or any of these guys asks you a NEC question, the most obvious answer is probably not the right answer because all of those guys know this code like the back of their hand. So this is one of those situations where they just go like this and be like, let me ask you a question. <laughs> and they'll just look real high into the sky and just, that's know, right. And they'll say how smart they are. Absolutely. And, and they'll they say compared to you, right? Oh, does yeah. I know the type. Does a medium, do I, if I have a 4,160 amp circuit breaker, do I need an arc reduction maintenance switch on it? And it's uh, 1,200 amps. Does it say, is it over 1,200 amps? Is it 1,200 amps? And it's over 1,200 amps. It's a medium voltage breaker. I would say if it's a circuit breaker and it can be adjusted or rated to at 1,200 amps or above, Huh? Then you would need some type of situation whenever you need arc energy reduction. And I missed it. You missed Sounds it. Like I'm wrong. You know, there was a YouTube video I watched. There's this couple, and and he has a dog collar on his neck, and she's got the remote, and she's asking him questions about uh their them as a couple. And everyone he says, any one of these I get wrong, you can hit that button, and then and then every question. He's going to, they turn up the power and they got this video put together. She's asking like, when did we meet? Uh, when did we get married? What's our, uh, what's our anniversary date and stuff like that. I'm, I, that's what I need is I need a shock collar on you. Sure. Let's uh, yep. do it. If, as long as it brings in the views, I'll do anything for this channel. How about that? <laughs> there we go. 24087 is in part seven, right? Yes. But. If you go to the beginning of 240, let's go to the, the 240 dot, 
240.1. And I learned this because I did the same thing you did. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't have a shock collar. Did you either. also have a shock collar on you? <laughs> no, I didn't you, have any shock collar. You behaviorally learned. That's right. That, that's how so, it <laughs> so 240 in dot one says parts one through seven of this article provide the general requirements for overcurrent protection and overcurrent protective devices, not more than a thousand volts. So that would include the part seven having to do with cartridge fuses and stuff like that, right? Yes. So that includes 240.67, which is not what this right, right. video, but it's going to be the sister video I'm sure we'll eventually get to. Exactly. To so, yeah. so part one through seven are a thousand volts and less. So what's part eight? Let's take a look. Part, what's the title of part, part eight? eight? covers overcurrent protection for those portions of supervised industrial installations operating at voltages of not more than a thousand volts nominal. I don't know why I needed the period right there. I should have worded it correctly. Not yep. more than a thousand volts nominal. I think that's a little bit better. Yeah. So part eight is supervised and then part nine is over a thousand volts. So right. One through seven only apply up to a thousand volts. So two forty eighty seven to your point, two forty sixty seven do not apply to medium voltage circuit breakers. Mm -hmm. So I learned that uh, a while ago, and um, and it was one of those phone calls. You know, hey, you know, I, do I have to do this? And I was like, well, yeah. It says twelve hundred amps. I said the same answer you gave. Yeah. And then um, I don't know what made me go back to two forty oh one. So here's a word of advice. But you've really, this is why it's really important to understand everything. Understand, understand the scope of article of, of uh, articles. Understand the scope of the NEC, right? If it's a mining application, if it, if Mr. Tim Crouch or Mr. Utility, you know, he's the, the National Electrical Code does not apply to something that the utility zone, and that's up front in the book. So if you're trying to apply this book there, you know, you'd be like, well. You can if you want to, but you were going above and beyond <laughs> outside of the, the rules. So, but in any case, um, uh, that's another thing that we didn't put in here, but it's a very important point. All right. Documentation. So if you think about uh, the, the requirements, A, B, and C. So we talked about the parent text. I think we have a good feeling that if it's Less than 1,000 volts, right? So 480-volt systems, if you're in Canada, 600 volts. If you're 1,000 volts and less, if you are, if you can adjust that circuit breaker to 1,200 amps or above, um, and that's pretty much it. There, it doesn't say if it's AC or DC, right? So you have a 1,200 amp DC breaker, you're into arc energy reduction. Um, what else? So that sort of gives you the flavor for when you're getting into the requirement. Now we're going to get into documentation. Perfect. So right off the bat, the, the focus in the 2020 cycle, David, was around arcing currents. We don't define arcing currents in the National Electrical Code. Does it say, now you pointed out maximum and minimum arcing current. Where do you get those terms from? You. No, just kidding. Uh, I, get, I think it's from IEEE, right? From 1584. 1584. Yeah. IEEE 1584 tells us that if your arcing current, if when you calculate arc, you calculate a minimum and a maximum arcing current for any value. And typically as an engineer, what I'll do, and you said it earlier, about motor contribution, about turning all the motors on, turn all of your motors on, figure all of your impedances at their lowest values from transformers and whatnot. Because remember on a transformer, you have to do plus or minus 10%, right? Sure. So you would do minus 10% on all of those, get the highest fault current, and then turn all those motors off, model the system with all the motors off, the highest impedances on anything that has a range of impedances like transformers. And you get those two bolted fault current values. And then you calculate two values of arcing current for each of those and establish the clearing times, whichever of that gives you the largest or highest 
incident energy, that's what you label with, right? Absolutely. Now, what this is dealing with, I don't have to do all that. 24087, it doesn't care about incident energy. Although the title is Instant Energy Reduction, there's no numbers on instant energy. It's all focused on the clearing time of the arcing current. Why? Why does it have to do with the clearing time of the arcing current? Yeah. Well, we talked about before, right? It's to, because there's less energy, so the circuit breaker is going to take a little bit more time depending on what it is. But you just want to make sure that that circuit breaker is prepared for that minimum amount that st could still be dangerous. Right. And there was discussion at the code panel where they wanted to... They wanted to... Um, I just lost my train of thought, but what they wanted to do was say, look, the incident energy number can't be greater than this number. Okay. Yeah. They wanted to put like, it can't be greater than eight calories or four calories. But the issue that you run into, which some people say there's an issue, which I don't know. I lean more towards, I like to have that number because if you just say, look, you can't have an instant energy number greater than this value. I don't care how you get there. Right. You just have to have to get there, right? But what they'll tell you is that 70E is what drives the incident energy. And if the National Electrical Code said anything like that, then it would be stepping on the toes of 70E, if that makes sense. So It does. Yep. So we're what we can do, though, is we can say, look, the arcing current has to be in the instantaneous region or in it has to activate one of these technologies and so in the 2020 cycle they were very clear to add that sentence documentation shall be provided to demonstrate that whatever it is you choose out of the list that they give you it has to activate but they don't say minimum marking current david hmm. so if i use the maximum marking current because it saved me money would i be Technically wrong. Yes, technically. technically. Technically, yes. Would I be violating the National Electrical Code? It depends. It doesn't say the maximum <laughs> working the current chat. or minimum every, working uh, current. Every, yeah, that's true. It says the available working current. And here's here's what complicates it even more. Well, how is available fault current defined? If only we had people that were on code making panels to ask about this stuff. I know. I know. Man. Well, it's like looking back at the, the scrolls of the elders. And, you <laughs> know, I wish I could just the ask the people. You ain't right. You know that? <laughs> you ain't right. So, fault current available. Now, right. this isn't available arcing current, this is available fault current. The 2020 code changed the definition of, well, actually created the definition of available fault current. It was 70E that created the term first, and then we followed suit in the code. And it and says- this is in Article 100? It's in Article 100, and it says the largest amount of current capable of being delivered at a point, blah, blah, blah. So when you say available fault current, it's the largest amount of fault current that can be delivered at that point. When I say available arcing current, it's real easy to sit down and go, well, that's the maximum amount of arcing current that can be delivered to that point. But that would not technically be the right thing to do. That's right. And I, and I was thinking we were going to clean this up in the 2023 cycle, and we really didn't. And, and you know what? Hindsight being 2020, I, there wasn't even a public input that mentioned the minimum available arcing current. If you would have told me, I would have put it in. I know you would have. And I should have. I should have. I should have brought it up at the code panel, but I didn't. So what you have to do is you got to make notes. And, and, and I don't know that we can clean it up in the comment phase. I got to look to see if that would be new material or not. Right, right. Oh, I can put it in my ballot statement. Ah. And if I put God. it in my ballot statement, it would not be new material, 
which I haven't gotten my ballot yet. Ladies and gentlemen, how about that? Look at them cookies. <laughs> now, Robert says 70E does not define arcing current. Right. Uh, they don't define arcing current, but they do define available fault current. And that's where the National Electrical Code got it from. So available fault current was defined in 70E. Available fault current was then put into Article 100 to align with that. And they put the same image on available fault current. And I agree with you, Robert. We, we probably should define available arcing current as well. And that would be a good public input, in my opinion, for both 70E and the National Electrical Code, because nowhere do we define that. And we're using it in 24087 and in 24067. So how do I remind you to put that in your ballot stuff? This is what you do is you go into the language or you write up a little text and you send it to me. <laughs> okay. I just didn't know what day I should do it. Right. Uh, it's not going to be, I'm not sure when I'm going to get my ballot. I, I don't know, but um, I'll have to add that in so that we can fix that uh, next cycle. Gotcha. Okay. So documentation should also be provided. Um, let's just, now you came up with a good checklist, right? Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that Tom was talking about at the beginning of this particular video is that we came up with a document. Number one, Eaton has a 2020 NEC code change document that you can, I think, I believe, Tom is going to put in the description of this particular video. In that, under 24067 and 24087, you're going to be able to find this document in the PDF that has to do with arc energy reduction documentation. And so if we go to the next slide here, it'll just go over... Just the normal stuff, whenever it comes to the permit number, the date, project name, everything that you would need whenever it comes to the inspection form of 24087, and then the compliance checklist. Do you, at, of any of these things for number one, do you have a particular solution that covers this particular thing? All you're going to have to do is just check one of them, and then scrolling down now to, this is a project uh, gone under uh, performance testing, particularly whenever it comes to primary current injection testing or some other means that is clear by the manufacturer which we'll get to check yes and then we have all the places that you need to um, send that documentation documentation to according to the code and this is particularly we wrote this in case you are an inspector in case you are a, a contractor in case you are um, you know builder anything like that whenever it comes to all of the different triangulations whenever it comes to the electrical industry, you should be able to use this document to either check your work or make sure you're good to go um, engineering-wise or contracting-wise or inspection-wise. Uh, you should be good to go for both for 240, 67, and 87. So if you scroll down or whatever in that PDF or ask me for a paper version, which are under my computer right now, uh, one, they have several manuals that are in paper, and it's what I'm actually using to prop up my camera to be able to get to this particular height. However, if you contact me after this, I can send you a paper version of that 2020 NEC change document, which has these checklists. I, I would say a PDF version is probably going to be a little bit easier if you're going to use these types of things for, um, for checklists because you can print them out. Um, you don't have to keep on just ordering paper versions from me and just keep on tearing them out. And then uh, I just have to send you different copies of the book. But so what's uh, your... yeah, please let me know or check that URL uh, at the bottom part of this video. What's your email address? DavidASmithAdeaton.com. You don't have to capitalize the whole thing, but if you choose to, uh, that's absolutely fine with me. It'll definitely get to me. And looks like Tom put it in the chat there. So please let me know. Uh, hit me on LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff. Yes. I'm not documenting that. I'm not saying it. <laughs> I don't need any more abuse. Tom gives me that enough already, as you can see. Absolutely. Probably, real quick, I am on very low battery for my audio. I can go and get a alternate audio and be back in two seconds if that is okay with you. Sure, that's fine with me. Perfect. Just one second, everybody. Sure thing. And we'll continue on. So if you think about these, um, I, seriously, use him and abuse him, email him, ask him questions. He's good at that stuff. So um, this is your instantaneous, like on an R-frame circuit breaker, way up there, 17,500 amps. Uh, and think about it. If you are using uh, this circuit breaker 
on uh, and adjusting it down to like 800 amps on, on an 800 amp application that instantaneous is way over there to the right and it, and you will be in the long time region from an arcing current perspective test 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 when we you're very low very low david oh how about now test no nope, very low oh really testing wait a second do that again testing test okay test better worse that's a good bit in between yep okay i got you. i'm adjusting your volume on my end too perfect all right so um instantaneous region it's important to understand what the instantaneous region is on a trip curve right so documentation you have to show that you are your arcing current is either in the instantaneous region or in the activation zone for one of those technologies. And if you're using instantaneous, it's important to understand what is instantaneous and, and how to understand the, the trip curve. So very critical uh, for proper application. Better, much more gooder. Yes, it's much gooder. I'm glad right. to hear it. So um, arcing current is a new term. It's not defined within the NEC. It's not defined... Um, it is defined in 1584, but but the way it's defined is not really going to help you in applying 24087 because it it just says the arcing current is is through a plasma blah blah blah. It doesn't tell you if it's the minimum or maximum, right? So, but in any case, uh, arcing current's a new term. There's there's your 1584 definition: a fault current flowing through an electrical arc plasma. Okay, it doesn't tell you if it's the minimum or maximum or if there is a minimum and maximum. It's just the electrical arc flowing through a plasma. Now I have a question for you whenever you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Well, let's, I know we're, we're going to eventually go to a 24087B, but in the informational note, number four, IEEE 1484 2002, IEEE Guide for Performing Arc Flash Hazard Calculations is one of the available methods that provide guidance in determining arc current. So arc current is there. It's not defined, but it is actually there, but it's under an informational note. So now we're getting to this, you know, the style uh, you know, style guide and stuff like that and the little things of the NEC, but it is there. Is it defined? Not really, but the good news is that IEEE 1584 is at least listed in the code. So if people are trying to find out these particular values, it is there. Um, for you to do a little bit more digging. Yeah. So yeah, and that and it tells you it, it's it's one of the methods that provide guidance on determining arcing current. But again, it doesn't tell you are you determining the maximum or the minimum. Completely agree. Yeah. I'm absolutely on your team on this. I would never disagree with you. That's why you have me on the program. There, that's right. There you go. That's <laughs> yeah, that's right. Daryl Hill is in the house. My good friend Daryl. He says, is it possible to know min or max current through an arc? Yes, it is, Daryl. And I'll tell you what we do. We get there through IEEE 1584. So what we did in IEEE 1584, Dr. Lee from Texas came up to our facility at Busman and where there was a research foundation, all this other good stuff. And what we do is Dr. Lee created arc flash after arc flash after arc flash after, after arc flash. After arc flash. And then when you thought you were done, he created another one. Tack another one on. Tacked another one on. So... <laughs> Now what he now then then what he did was he took all that data and, and what data does he have? He has the calories. He has the uh, doesn't have pressure. He has this. We measured sound, I believe. We measured a bunch of data points, but one of the key one of the key data points was a waveform. You know how you have a sine waveform, right? For a a current. If you looked at the arcing current waveform, it's a mess, right? So, but he knew. He had the arcing current waveforms captured for every one of those events. And then what he did was he plotted a bunch of those on, uh, on a chart, on a graph. 
And then what he did was he said, I want to create a curve. How do I do this? How can I do this? Um, let's do this. I'm going to do something here. File, new, blank. All right, so here's what he did. Wait, everybody. Uh. Let me tell you something. <laughs> so he basically took and, and he took a graph. He did it on PowerPoint, right? This is how he recorded all of his findings? Uh, he did not. No, no. He used uh, Excel spreadsheets, you know, all that. Smart. Kind of yeah, might as well. So, so then what he did was, how do I get a pencil? Where's my pencil? Um, draw. I don't have draw on here. Is it under insert? Well, yeah, it should be. Yeah. It's very small on my screen, but that little menu you had before should have been good. Insert. Here we go. <clears throat> here we go. So he would say for this value of current and this value of time, I have a data point. And then he would go, I have another data point over here. And then he would say, I have another data point here. And he would just keep doing that until what he did was he had a bunch of data points all over the place. And he would have a data point there. He would have a data point here. He'd have a data point here. And then maybe, and maybe he had a couple down here, right? Oh, outliers. Yeah, you have those outliers, right? So, so what he what he does is he says, "All right, I am going to draw a curve, and I'm going to take in these, and I'm going to draw another curve, and I'm going to take in all of these, and then what he does is he develops an equation. He developed an equation to calculate those values of arcing currents that were down here." And those values of arcing currents up here. And what do you call those? Your minimum and maximum arcing currents. So he has this huge equation, which is based upon all the different parameters that he measured, the configurations of the bus, the distance between the electrodes and all that good stuff. And he has all of this data. And then he developed two equations for arcing currents to get him a minimum and a maximum. What we did in the 2002 version of 1584 was we calculated one version of arcing current and we just went, did 85% of that and got the lower number. So his efforts were to create, now that's the arcing currents. And then what he did was he did the same thing for incident energy. He would say, take each of those arcing current values and their clearing times and determine incident energy based upon that, which was a whole nother set of equations developed in a similar manner. So he basically developed the equations to calculate a minimum and maximum arcing current. So that's how I can answer Daryl's question to say, yes, it's, po it's possible to calculate them. It is also possible to measure them, but n what we've also learned is that every arc is different. It, you're not going to get the same repetitive. It's not like I can get repetitive, uh, you know, can, even based on the same set of conditions. I, every time I create an event, it's going to be somewhat different. So, I mean, a lot of electricity stuff like that. Whenever it comes to particular phenomenons like this, you're going to have so many variables that, you know, take away or contribute or anything like that. I mean, it's like predicting lightning. You have a pretty good idea. It's a lot based on probability, but um, you probably have a pretty good idea of what is most likely to happen, what is least likely to happen, that kind of thing. Right. And, and you think about the amount of current that's flowing. You know, this, this um, event, this is an arc flash event, which you're seeing with the light and all that good stuff. That's an arc flowing through the air. The, the impedance of that plasma plume, I call it a plasma plume, and typically people laugh just like that. I don't know why. I um, know that you love that word, and so I laugh because <laughs> I know you do not it's a plasma cloud. Well, but the impedance of the of that plasma is going to change based upon the amount of copper and steel and what's melted and what's been vaporized. So that changes that changes the art the signature of the arcing currents and all that jazz. So um, it completes and, and and basically your current is flowing through the air. 
it's arcing. It's arcing. That's absolutely right. Uh, so it's outside of the normal path. So one method that we use is IEEE 1584. Now, the other method I see, uh, Ross, um, how would you define arcing current since there are multiple methods to determine arcing current? 1584, Ralph Lee, Dr. Ross, you're right. You're right, Ross. It's, it's hard, but what you could say is if you said, I'm going to determine the minimum amount of arcing current. In fact, Ralph Lee doesn't calculate arcing current. Ross, take a look at the IEEE paper from Ross, uh, from Ralph Lee, and his method does not determine arcing current at all. His method goes straight to incident energy. And the reason I say that, the reason I say that, 24087, here's a here's a challenge or a problem that we have, sort of. 24087 says you have to compare the arcing current. So that means you have to calculate arcing current. The limitations of IEEE 1584 is at 106,000 amps. We did not do any testing beyond 106,000 amps. So if you have 150,000 amps available, there is no method to calculate arcing current in existence. I thought it was the Ralph Lee method. So I, because everybody I asked, I said, what do you do when you're at 150,000 amps? And uh, 1584 says, we use the Ralph Lee method. 70E recognizes the Ralph Lee method. Um, I asked uh, power system engineers, even in our group, I said, what do you do? Well, SKM automatically uses the Ralph Lee method. And they'll tell you that. So here was my issue with that. When I used the Ralph Lee method, I did 106,000 amps on, uh, on an overcurrent protective device. And I wasn't into the instantaneous region. I wasn't into the current limiting region of the fuse. Okay. And it, the incident energy was high. I needed to get a well above 106,000 amps to get the arcing current in a fast clearing time. Okay. But, I went to 107,000 amps in SKM and calculated it. And I went from like 100 calories to uh, two calories because it used the Ralph Lee method. And the Ralph Lee method does not calculate arcing current. It looks at what is the trip time at the three phase bolted fault current value. So I'm, I, was, I was a little bit hesitant about the Ralph Lee method. But I don't know anybody who has ever calculated and dressed for a, an, an equation that was performed based upon the Ralph Lee method and, and not been dressed properly. So, but I don't have any history of that. Uh, but in any case, uh, that, was, uh, that was one of my concerns. So we do have a challenge in meeting 24087 when your arcing currents are, when your available bolted fault current is greater than 106,000 amps. So we can get close based on lab conditions. We don't work in lab we don't work in lab conditions. Lots of variables to consider to get these values which makes it difficult. So Daryl, love you brother. So and you're right. Um we don't work in a lab environment. These tests were done in what we call arcs in a box. It's a lab it wasn't done in real equipment. Now if I look at, um, I'll give you a case in point. I, I wrote an IEEE paper with Ken White. And Ken and I did, uh, presented it at, um, we presented that paper at the IEEE Electrical Safety Workshop. And I'm trying to find it. Um, give me give me a second. Um, uh, 240.87. I'm just going to do a quick search. If I can find it real quick, I'll, I'll throw those slides up. Because nothing matched it. Dmitrovich. So here's what, here's what I learned. What we learned was that the... Um, he had an actual event. He, he used the arc reduction maintenance switch 
And the with the maintenance switch on, the electrical workers were working in a, a piece of equipment. They accidentally touched an energized piece of equipment with the chain of a come along. There was a little blue arc. Now we calculated based on IEEE 1584, like and the arc reduction maintenance switch, like two point some calories. But the damage to the equipment did not reflect two point some calories. And I think that's because of a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. The clearing time was much faster of the overcurrent protective device. The spacings inside the equipment, you didn't get that big plasma plume and have that arc go through and reduce it even more. So there were a lot of things because our equipment is built a lot different than what we had in the lab. But I feel comfortable that even when you're calculating it in 1584, you're gonna be conservative so the electrical worker is not in a um, is not underdressed for the occasion. Now, when it comes to the arcing current, I agree with you, Daryl. The arcing currents are probably going to be different based upon real equipment. But we, I would say, available short circuit currents are going to be different if you actually had a, a fault in a power distribution system. It's not going to be exactly what you calculated because we don't account for a lot of different impedances or whatnot. But we do the best we can with the equations that we have to meet the code requirements and to to uh to come up with designs that's the best i can do okay ross ross is going to play devil's advocate arcing currents as we use them now aren't tangible things they are the result of equations from empirically derived equations exactly what i just said that's the best we can do we can only do what we can do and and you know what the uh, the table method in 70e I'll argue, I mean, I've, I've gone back and forth with Jim Dolan on this until I finally realized is, you know, when I think about arcing currents and whatnot, in 70E, you have the table method, which, uh, David, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It doesn't use the um, arcing currents and clearing times. Basically, it says, hey, if you're downstream of a molded case circuit breaker and your available fault current's less than this number and your voltage is, is this number or less and it's a panel board, this is how you dress. And Got you it. go, well, wait a second. I should be doing math. I should be doing an arcing current. I should be calculating this. I should be comparing clearing times. But to Jim's point, hey, if it's if you're working in a in, in, you're not in a labeled environment, our goal is to get people into PPE. It's estimating. You're going to estimate the available fault current. You're going to estimate the clearing time of an overcurrent protective device, and then you're going to make a decision based upon the table method in 70E to select your personal protective equipment. If you said on every one of those jobs you need to calculate it, that would be make things much more difficult, and it probably wouldn't happen. So, um, and what we learned in that actual case study was that our calculations of incident energy based upon the conditions was higher than what we actually experienced. Those guys were in a light personal protective anyway. They weren't in a 40 cal moon suit. They were in an eight cal outfit, which is the way they dressed. They either dressed eight or 40. They dressed for eight. They did their work. They had an event. Nobody was injured. Nobody was killed. The equipment didn't have to be uh, reinstalled and, and updated. We were able to clean it out and get it re-energized uh, very quickly. So that's the whole point. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. All right. And, and if you think about 24087, I'm only going to do these three steps in the whole process that 1584 defines for us. I'm going to calculate the three-phase bolted fault current value. I'm going to calculate the maximum and minimum arcing currents, and then I'm going to determine those clearing times. And that's the, the process I'm going. And I'm, I'm actually, once I calculate the maximum and minimum, which one of those numbers would you recommend I use, David? I would recommend using minimum arcing current. Me personally. as well. Me as well. So, uh, but the code doesn't necessarily say that, but that's the number you want to use. You want to take that minimum arcing current and then use that number and evaluate your um, your values. And here's the, this is the range of the model for, uh, for 1584. So you have up to 15,000 volts, which we know 24087 doesn't go, doesn't apply beyond 1,000 volts. Already went over that. 50, 60 hertz, bolted fault current values up to 106,000 amps. 
for 600 volt systems. That's it. So if I have more than 106,000 amps, I got to get creative. And then uh, there's the gaps between the conductors and all that good stuff. And then, and then I, and we already had this discussion about Ralph Lee. And Ralph Lee wrote his paper in 1982. It was called The Other Electrical Hazard, Electric Arc Blast Burns. And he established a relationship between temperature and skin burns. It preceded 1584. And it's recognized in 70E, but it does not calculate an arcing current value. But beyond 106,000 amps, that's what we use. And research doesn't exist beyond 106,000 amps. This would be a good, uh, and I've, I've toyed with the idea of doing an IEEE paper on this. Uh, taking some data points, sit in the lab, I and mean, we can generate up to 300,000 amps in our, our Busman facility in Ellisville, in St. Louis, Missouri. Or is that Missouri? Um, Depends on which side. I think if you're in the northern, it's Missouri. Southern is Missouri. That's what I've heard. Is that right? Okay. All right. And if you're from Weirton, West Virginia? Uh, I say Missouri. I first. say Missouri. Yeah. yeah. Even though I'm from south of the Mason-Dixon line, you're from north of the Mason-Dixon line. That's hey, true. one thing I did want to mention real quick, as I, did, I just want to make sure we're not going to get off topic of it. Yeah. Of that particular white paper that you were talking about that I wrote, um, I couldn't remember what made the cut and what didn't. As you know, people out there, some some things do not make the cut. But what did make the cut was under my 24067 parts, um, I have calculations for examples of systems that do and don't need um, this particular stuff. And so I know we're talking about 24087, and I keep on mentioning 24067. The reason I do that is because I mentioned both of these articles in the white paper, and uh, they're basically sister, sister articles um, they're talking about the same thing whenever it comes to arc energy reduction. Um, one's for fuses and one's for circuit breakers. Yep. So and this check is, that out and if you have any questions, let me know. Yep, this is the paper. I have the link uh, at the on my YouTube site down below. You can download this and a few other resources as well. Um, there's a there's some good logic in here. I think uh, I think you did a good job with this one. Um, I do it again. And there's your arcing current values and 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 the fuses and whatnot. So. I like it. It looks good. There's your 24067, 24087 solutions. So that's a reference uh, for everybody out there that uh, you have uh, available to you, and it's in, at, at the link down below. Below me, not you know. I know he was pointing at me, but it's probably going to be below me. Yeah, so it's keep even, on. It's even the, further down below. From the Brady bunch scenario. Yeah, right? this yeah. is, uh, what was that? <laughs> What was that program? It's probably before your time. That was the Brady uh, Bunch. Right? Yeah, the Brady Bunch. <laughs> you ain't right. Uh, you ain't right. Um, <laughs> so, so the conservative approach I take on all this: if I have available fault current greater than one hundred six thousand amps, and I'm still not in the arcing, and I'm in my even at a high, I'll, what I'll do is I'll calculate the arcing currents at 106,000 amps, and if my if I don't actuate my equipment, my instantaneous on my circuit breaker, or if I'm not in the 0.07 second for 24067, I am throwing on an arc reduction technology, and then you just want to make sure that you're in the in that technology's region at the arcing current values of 106,000 amps right make sure it's calibrated and set to everything right you can't just slap it on make sure you do everything set it to where it needs to be and then you're, you should be good to go exactly so and if you're if your arcing currents at 106,000 amps are in the instantaneous region or in the um, zone selective interlocking region and all that good stuff then um then you're going to be there at 150,000 amps or 200,000 amps so So each technology is going to have different method to do that. All right, approved methods. So you can have approved methods, right? Yep. Now we're into approved methods, and there's seven options for you. The seventh option is an approved equivalent means. A plethora, just a plethora. An embarrassment of riches that we have here at two forty eighty seven of the twenty twenty edition of the National Electrical Code. I love it. <laughs> Zone selective interlocking, differential relaying. Now, uh, and, and we're, we're going to talk about these in a certain order. 
I rarely see differential relaying on 480 volt systems or 208 volt systems. Differential relaying, in my experience, has been in medium voltage applications. Doesn't mean you don't see it ever on a 480 volt system or a 600 volt system, but much rarer. Um, energy reducing maintenance switch with a local status indicator and the active arc flash mitigation systems. Obviously, you have your instantaneous trip. Uh, we added this language that you cannot temporarily adjust. So what we learned was some people were saying, hey, I'm just going to roll down the instantaneous when I work and roll it back up again. And, and they said that that's equivalent to three, the energy reduction maintenance switch with a local status indicator which is not technically true. Because when you roll down the instantaneous and roll it back up, you don't have any indication that it's on or off. The energy reducing maintenance switch is an on-off button. It puts it in that mode, takes it out of that mode. You're not trying to have to go, what was the setting on? And when you turn it back, right? So we outlawed the temporary, and then you have the instantaneous override. Do you know what an instantaneous override is on a breaker, David? If it's an override that is instantaneous. Exactly. And it, it's a, it's, it's a, every multi case circuit breaker, it's there. It's not adjustable. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, an analog circuit that doesn't require a brain. It just basically says the breaker goes, when your fault current gets greater than this number, you're going without an intentional delay. Got and it. it's faster than the instantaneous because the instantaneous has to use the brain to determine the tripping. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about faster than instantaneous. That's right. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. How about that for marketing? How about them apples, huh? <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to start there because that's the most inexpensive solution sure. in this whole bucket. And in reality, in many commercial applications, we're picking the overcurrent protective devices we're picking standard multi-key circuit breakers. We're series rating them. So I'm not worried about cascading events. I'm not worried about selective coordination. I'm not putting any intentional delays. The chances of me being having an arcing current in that region are pretty good on some of these commercial, light commercial jobs. So we estimate the available fault currents, and then we calculate the arcing currents. We can calculate the uh, uh, available fault currents, and we have an arcing current. We have uh, tools to help determine these values. Uh, and this is the arcing current calculator that we have, and it's based upon the 2018 version of IEEE 1584. You can put any value of short circuit current, and it'll give you both values of arcing current. This one is 85%, uh, so that's the 2002 version. We've updated this so that it calculates both arcing currents. And then you just need to compare it with the instantaneous region on a circuit breaker. If your arcing current's high enough, go away. Leave me alone. I'm done. Right? Why you why you keep bugging me about it when I'm in the instantaneous region? Done. So temporary adjustment, set it and forget it. There it is. Set it and forget it. Do you know what that's from? I do not. Oh man. It. Other than you. Years, I know it from you. Years ago, there was a commercial on TV for this rotisserie thing. And, okay. and he would cook all these different things, and he would say, you set it and forget it. Wow. Is yeah. this uh, Billy Mays who we're talking about here, or is this somebody else? I'm not sure what the guy's name was. Good to know. But Google it. I will. Okay. Okay, you'll be quizzed on it later. <laughs> it's Next time I come on, I'll have to remember where Set It and Forget It came from. That's right. Um, Ross, sorry if, if you already covered this, but can you comment on 24087 requirement on main breakers when it is a common technique to not use the main breaker as the protective device for the bus so ARMS doesn't work? Ronco. Ronco, Showtime, Rotisserie. That's what it was. Ron Popel. That's it. Joe Bellantoni, he knew it. Steve Froming was all over that crap. Yeah. All right, Ross, um, let's think about this. Um, 248.7 requirement on main breakers 
when it is a common technique to not use so. Remember, this, if you don't have a main breaker, let's say that like what I'm showing on the screen here is a main breaker and a panel board. If you don't have a main in the panel board, you have a feeder upstream feeding the panel board. If that feeder is 1200 amps, then this applies. It would work. Um, and remember, this applies to the circuit breaker. Sorry if you already covered this, but you can't come. Main breakers, one is a common technique to not use a main breaker as the protective device for the bus. So arms doesn't work. I don't know what you mean by that. Because the arc reduction maintenance switch, whether it be arms or zone selective interlocking or whatever it is, um, let's say the arc, or instantaneous. If you don't have a main in that panel board, you have a feeder that's feeding it. If it's a service entrance equipment, the theory I had, heard was the arc can jump from the, ah, okay. Yes, Ross. Um, you're talking about line side propagation. Very good point. Um, what he's talking about, David, have you heard about uh, line side propagation? I've heard about it, but I haven't gotten that far in the series yet, you know? Yep. I think it might be season four where I'm on season two, you know? All right. So here's Boiler. what he's, let's say I have this panel board. Let me show you something. You know what that's from? Again, I think it's from you. All of this stuff, I assume, is just from you. Oh, that's beautiful. The only thing I've gotten so far is Brady Bunch. Well, so let me tell you something. Is is uh, Jim Carrey. Okay. I can't Sounds remember like if it was Saturday Night Live or if it was in Living Color or one of those programs he was on. He was Fire Marshal Bill, I think it was. And he, he was a fire marshal, but he was completely burned. And he's smoking. And he would say about, I don't know, about uh, you should never cook on your stove with grease and do this. And he goes, let me tell you something. And then he would do it and it would all go. Anyway, you got to look it up. Fire Marshal Bill. I will. Yep. Joe Bell and I got a lot of assignments tonight. Yeah, you're learning all kinds of stuff. So what Ross is talking about is, let's say, for example, I have an arcing event right in here. Okay. And remember that arc flash event where you had that big plasma plume. <laughs> yes. Okay. Or the big ball of plasma or whatever you want to call it. If that plasma engulfs the line side. Yes. I can create an arc on the line side of that breaker, which is what we call line side propagation. And if okay. that happens, Okay. then the clearing time for the incident energy values that we are using in this box, the clearing time of that arcing current is based upon the line side of that transformer or the utility fuse. Sure. Or if, the, if that wasn't here and it was fed from a, um, I don't know, a, 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 another panel board and the breaker was up here, the clearing time for the incident energy calculation would be based upon this overcurrent device not that overcurrent device. Got it. So, and, and you know what? That goes for any of the technologies listed in 24087. Okay. Whether it be the arc reduction maintenance switch, instantaneous, zone selective interlocking, the arc quencher, the uh, arc, uh, the active arc flash mitigation system, differential relaying, any of that is the same issue on line-side propagation. So, um, Mr. Ross has a, a very good observation, which is a part of one of the issues that I have with 24087. And that's why these slides were created was because of what Ross pointed out. This application that I'm showing you, the red zone, is... You don't have protection for a fault on that side. And if I have line side propagation, I have this breaker, this breaker here, if it if I'm working in the instantaneous range, will protect downstream. How far downstream will depend upon, like if I have a fault at this motor, 
if that length of conductor, if my arcing current at that motor is still in the instantaneous region of that breaker, I'm still providing arc reduction for that motor. Okay. Right? Now, yes. if I have a very long run, I'm not going to provide any protection. So that's an important... And an instantaneous is where, it on a molded case circuit breaker, it's at least 10 times the handle rating. So... A 1200 amp breaker would be 1,200 amps, 10 times, right? Yep. Is that right? 1200 or 12,000 amps? There you go. 12,000. I'm thinking that, that, that's not right. 12,000 amps would be your minimum instantaneous region. When you pl- employ an arc reduction maintenance switch, now you're down to 2,400 amps. Okay. So I've lowered the instantaneous so I can reach further down into the distribution system, I can activate faster. My speed, if we do what, um, uh, not Steve Froming, but uh, my good friend uh, Daryl Hill, I think Daryl brought it up, that if I have a fast enough clearing time, like the, um, like, uh, you know, we've, we've done these events. We never publish them because they're not exciting because you, they're gone. You didn't get the plasma plume. You're not getting the line side propagation because there's no plasma that you're expelling because you activate it so freaking fast. So I, I don't, I, I, I can get that, um, I can get that type of action and I can count on it, but 1584 tells me I should assume line side propagation. Worst case scenario. Now, L. Teresi, I thought 247 applied to all 1200 amp circuit breakers even one that is downstream from another. Yes, that is exactly right, Al. That is exactly right. But if I have, if this is a 1200 amp breaker and this is 800 amp, I only need it on this breaker, not that breaker. Uh, If this is 2000 amps, if this guy's 2000 amps and that guy's 1200 amps, I have to put it on both breakers. And what that does that so let's get into the other technologies because once we start understanding the zones of protection you're going to see some of the some of where I have I've got the same thought process that Ross has going on the same thought process that Al has going on I think 24087 can use a little bit more love all right, so that's the instantaneous region. It's typically as you go into that one. I'm gonna catch up with you just in one second. Give me one second. You can keep on going. Keep right. rolling. Yep, no problem. I'm in. No problem. So arcing currents greater than instantaneous pickup, and that's option five. Uh, that's the temporary adjustment. You know, and, and again, don't modify the instantaneous in the field. The reason we don't get into that is because all of these trip units will look differently. Some, like in this case here, all three of those dials control the same instantaneous. You've got to change all three dials. That's one for each pole. You'll have some that look like this. This is really nice because, you know, it gives you a, uh, it, it says INST. So, you know, that's the instantaneous, but that's just one manufacturer's way of doing it. Here's another one. Okay. That says IN. Well, which one of these dials is instantaneous? It It's not very clear on which dial is the instantaneous. So how is an electrician in the field going to know which one of these dials to turn to make sure that they are adjusting the instantaneous down? So it's for all of these reasons that <clears throat> the uh, co-panel 10 said, that is ikshne on the mikshne. Do not do any field adjustments in the field. Instantaneous override, molded case, insulated case circuit breakers all have an instantaneous override, and that's there to, to protect the breaker. You just have to look at the manufacturer's instructions to find out what that value is for each of the breakers. All right, so faults in that zone are not provided with protection by the main device instantaneous when the arcing current is in the instantaneous region. Now, 230.62C barrier requirements help or service entrance equipment will help reduce the likelihood of the occurrence. Now, what um, panel 10 just passed is 
that panel on the secondary of a transformer will have to have a barrier on on the main lugs for that. And that was Jim Dollard's uh, public input as well, because he recognizes, as do others, that really when you have that main overcurrent protective device, you really need to provide barriers because you you want to avoid unintended uh, coming in contact with those those lugs because it it's not going to prevent the line side propagation, but it will reduce the likelihood of that happening and occurring. So, and that's what we, we you know, as a power system people, that's our goal. Right? Absolutely. That's the whole point. That's why we're out here. That's why we're here, baby. And that's your instantaneous override. And there's your arc reduction maintenance switch, which... I mean, the, 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 the protection scheme looks exactly like the instantaneous. Very similar. It's just a lower value. And that's what it, this is what it'll typically look like on a, like a power circuit breaker lineup. You know, David, I, I like, I like this. I like this method right here. You're a big fan. I do. And you know why I like that? What's that? I can lock and tag it out. Good practice. Hmm? What do you say? It's good practice. Yes. Right? Very good practice. Good. I mean, just like shutting off a, a breaker. Like when you work, when you want to establish an electrically safe work condition, you have to turn breakers off and then you should lock and tag them out uh, when you turn them off. So this is no different. If you're going to... Uh, Turn that arc reduction maintenance switch because you're working downstream. You're going to want to lock and tag it out. Man, those eating guys, huh? Jeez. Got to love it, man. <laughs> um, and this is what we would have like on a multi-case circuit breaker. So, you know, there's your, um, your switches right in here. And that's on and off. And then you can establish the uh, performance of that um, in the settings. And this is basically what it's doing. So you're taking your trip curve, your um, delay, your this red curve is basically how that device would have operated without the arc reduction maintenance switch. And the blue is how it acts with it. Now here's another, my another, <laughs> our time current characteristic curves show that clearing time at one, two, three, 0.04 seconds. You and I both know it operates much faster than 0.04 seconds. Yes. But we have a lot of conservative engineers in our system, in our in our company that love to add those delays because of um, frequencies that they may say, well, at 50 hertz it operates this way, and at uh, you know these temperatures it operates that way. But they always put the worst case, which is what you want, right? Yeah, you want, and even that type of a clearing time at 0.04 seconds is going to be huge uh, difference in in arc energy. I'd rather be overdressed for that than underdressed. Arc flash mitigation, the active arc flash mitigation system, uh, or no, I'm sorry, that wasn't it. Zone selective interlocking. Let's take a look at that one. Now, everything we've looked at was instantaneous and arms, right? Am I froze here? Is that what's going on? What's what? the deal here? Do you see this? For some reason, I think my uh, my my fee's all getting funky. No, you're coming across perfectly fine. Great. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Didn't mean to interrupt. Keep on rolling. Yep. No problem. You're coming. You're coming through perfectly fine. So, how familiar are you with ZSI? I know it particularly from 24087. Um, I don't know what how you know any particular details. So outside of writing this particular paper. So, beam me up. Let's do this. Beam me up, Scotty. Well, uh, zone selective interlocking is yeah. a zone of protection where sure. you have uh, you're protecting in between these breakers. So, so to to um, Ross's point about line side propagation, all that good stuff. Zone selective interlocking does not look downstream. It provides protection in this zone. Your fault has to happen. On the line lugs of those branch or feeder breakers downstream and on the load lugs of the main overcurrent device. Got it. Okay. That's where the fault has to occur. And that's when you're in the zone of protection. So any fault in that zone is protected. And you'll know 
if you're in that equipment and you touch down here, your clearing time is going to be based upon the clearing time of that device, whatever it should be. If this is a low voltage assembly and that's say a 4,000 amp breaker with a 30 cycle delay, and this is a 2,000 amp breaker with a you know, 20 cycle delay, you're going to be dependent upon that or an 800 amp breaker if it's lower, right? You're going to be dependent upon that, not ZSI. And then, um, and then what this is showing you is that a fault outside of the zone of protection, ZSI sees the same amount of current going in, the same amount of current going out. Both of these devices see the fault. Neither, both of them will go based upon their programmed set points, whatever they are. And that's all that these, these, these slides are talking about. Are you going to make this deck available afterwards, or you just w want it to be? Well, they, we got the video. They, they got the yeah. whole video. Yeah, they got every slide, every video. But if We're somebody wants everything, uh, guys, it's okay. Yeah, if somebody yeah. if somebody does if some, if, I, if somebody educates and whatnot, you know, please, uh, you know, talk to me. Um, so there's my short time delay setting, and that's from a from from this application. That main breaker is going to trip based upon that short time delay. So whatever current that is set to, that is the current at which it will pick up. Got it. Um, so, and there's your short time delay pickup. So any arcing current greater than 2,400 amps, which is based upon this trip curve for a 1,200 amp breaker, any arcing current greater than 1,200 amps, 2,400 amps, will have a clearing time, <coughs> have a clearing time in this case, around 0.1 seconds. But normally you can adjust that down. That's not Dasani. Huh? I know, that's not water. I know it's not. Oh yeah, but it's water. You can't lie to me. <laughs> There's the arc quencher. Let's watch this one. Ooh. 85,000 amps. A low voltage assembly. This is the amount of energy that you'll have. Now, what we're gonna show you in the next video is the arc quenching technology taking this exact same event and reducing the clearing time. <coughs> That's it. There's like hardly anything going on. And that's your active arc flash mitigation system. You'll see that in 4080 volt, low voltage assemblies, things like that. And then you have the approved equivalent means. You just have to show that whatever it is that you're doing will do what you, what the, the, will perform like one of these other technologies. All right, David. We talked about when you get into it. We talked about right. the technologies that are available. And the very last thing is the performance testing, which we're already at seven o'clock. We can go through it. Yeah. I say we go through the performance testing. Yeah. And uh, and talk about that. What do you so you wanna lead the show on this one? Sure. So particularly whenever it comes to performance testing, um, it's a little bit more complicated on the sister article of two forty sixty seven because you're talking about fuses. And so it's particularly difficult to test a fuse because if it works then you have to replace a fuse so whenever we're talking about 24087 for circuit breakers there's a little bit more of an understanding that you could probably test it it should be a little bit better specifically in the code for the 2020 nec the performance testing new language i believe this is entirely new language for 2020 nec performance testing was not involved for any edition from 2017 before but it particularly calls out that you can use primary uh, whenever it comes to primary, oh uh, geez, of course, whenever I talk about this all the time. Primary current primary injection. Current injection, thank you. I couldn't remember the, the order of the words. For primary and current injection testing is the approved method that's specifically called out in the code. However, whenever it goes through that particular sentence, it talks about performance tested by primary current injection testing or another approved method when first installed 
uh, onto the site. And so it gives you that leeway of, yes, here is a good example of what you could do, but if a manufacturer has any other alternate ways that they particularly approve of, then you can go ahead and do that. And so what we also have whenever it comes to Eaton's engineering services, that we not only provide the primary uh, current injection testing, but we also would say you can use secondary current injection testing for not only the circuit breakers, but the fuses as well. And it's just different equipment, different things you might, um, I don't know, different obstacles you might have whenever it comes to the field. Because for primary current injection testing, I'm sure Tom is going to go through some of the equipment they use for that kind of thing. You're going to use some big hawking stuff. Right, you're going to use the Phoenix. You're going to use some other things that you probably need much more than 125 volt receptacle to be able to do this kind of thing for whatever size of breaker that you have. Of course, I lose my microphone whenever I'm talking for whatever size of breaker that you have. And so the DDA 1600 can put up to 16,000 amps. That's a big, huge deal to be able. And the Phoenix, what what is that? What did it say? 75,000. 75, That's a lot of amps, right? So to be in, and I've, I think this is at the PSEC up in uh, Warrendale, Pennsylvania. Like this thing is, is pretty big. And so if you're taking it out to the field, you might, you might need three phase. You might need some type of the source power to be able to run this thing just to test your breaker, which could not be an issue or it could be an issue for you. So I think actually on top of that is one of the um, equipment that we use for secondary current injection testing. Um, and so typically secondary current injection testing comes with something that is the size of a suitcase and you just need simple 125 volt, um, power to be able to do that. Now I'm not saying primary or secondary whenever it comes to circuit breakers are better or worse. What I'm saying is that you can do these kinds of things and you have the options to do it. And plus, I think Tom, you were talking about this earlier. If you're going to do your secondary current injection testing or primary current injection testing for 240 87 and you're already in the field doing this kind of stuff you might as well do your gfpe testing while you're already there that's right yeah yeah so it's, it absolutely makes sense to be able to document this stuff with the stuff that we've given you with the the, the checklist yeah. you know that'll cover everything that you need there Ch check out the the white paper we have on 240 67 or 87 whenever it comes to this stuff but yeah i mean if you're already having someone roll out there and do the testing for you or something like that then you might as well knock out your gfp testing as well yep and and when you do like the secondary current uh secondary testing like for example um the maintenance mode uh, we have this uh on certain digit trip trip units we have a kit and this is what it looks like you get this briefcase that um, that has the the basically what you need. You plug it into the front of the circuit breaker, and you have a test button there. You press that test button, and it gets you a test report. You can download the test report. It'll open that device, and it will run for the arc reduction uh, maintenance switch. We we also do the same type of deal for um, uh, the arc quencher. So arc quenchers have a little bit more complicated. But, uh, you know, uh, GE has the, uh, they call it the arc vault, and, and uh, we have the arc quencher. And if you look through some of these um, instructions, they're pretty comprehensive. I mean, they're very comprehensive. They show you everything that comes in the box. They show you pictures of the products that you're going to be testing, the terminations that you're going to have to have access to. Um, they even show you how to plug the devices in. Uh, and, and they walk you through step by step on how to test the technologies. Now, the arc quencher and this type of technology looks at current and a light source. So you need to know how to test each of the light sensors and run through the testing configurations. But to your point, David, I mean, you know, our services division and, and the other thing that we'll do is we will. Um, if there's a contractor out there who says, hey, I want to uh, get into this business or I'm going to do these this, the testing of your equipment or if it's an organization that does testing and they say, hey, you know, I'm not sure how you're how to do zone selective interlocking because I've done GFPE testing. We'll actually work with you, teach you how to do that in in our facility, in our experience centers or at our facilities across the country. And um, we'll show you how to uh, how to how to do this is zone selective interlocking. Um, like I say, it shows you how to plug the device in, the equipment. Yep. But uh, and we were there for it. 
you know, the last time we did, they did it, we took videos and stuff like that. It was incredibly informative. Um, yeah. Those guys up there are professionals. They know exactly what they're doing. And so if you ever want a tour or anything like that, please let us know. And I understand, you know, with the day and age that we have in 2020, it might yeah. not be as normally as um, um, available as normal. But, you know, once the world opens up again, we would love to give you a tour or something like this. If, if you would be interested in that, and we'll show you inter, in a zone select of interlocking and all the other stuff that we have from residential all the way up to industrial at that power uh, systems experience center just north of Pittsburgh, right up to I-79. Uh, <laughs> and we have one down in Houston, Texas, too. That's right. I, you know what? I haven't gotten there yet. I need oh, to get there. you got to see that one. It's really cool. Both are guys. Everybody, put me in the chat whenever you're going into to Houston. Email me, and I'll I'll hop in there with you. It'll be great. We'll hook you up. But that's the language that's in C. You know, it has to be performance t- tested by primary current injection testing or another approved method. And why did we have to put the other approved method in, David? I mean, I mean, because of the, the both the fuses. You could damage it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like a fuse. Don't want to do that. You know, if you have a fuse, I mean, I, I we always say test every fuse when you first put it in. But, uh, you know, we, we make a lot of money on fuses. And if you take technologies like the arc quencher, the arc quencher needs current and it needs light sources. And and the arc energy reduction technologies that you use may vary. And, and you have to, we had to point people to the manufacturer's instructions and other methods because... That might be what you need. You, you, they may tell you, you put current through this and you're going to buy another one. So sure. and it's future proof, right? The idea is to allow that leeway for future better technological advances that we have yep. for better testing. And that's why we have item seven on 24087, right? That's why we have or other approved means. We don't have to go through a whole nother code cycle and decide that some other thing is best whenever everyone knows it is, we're just waiting on everything to go through and the cycle and all logistics and everything like that. As long as your inspector is okay with it, or you as an inspector, uh, you believe that is um, legit and you've talked to the manufacturer and it seems fine. This is just a way for us to be able to code wise um, sign off of something that might be better, you know, the latest and greatest, right? Absolutely. And then you have your uh, you have your test reports. Um, you know you have to check the current transformers. If you're using C, if your system uses external CTs, you got to make sure the polarities are correct. There are um, a lot of things that you need to uh, to to check just to make sure. But you should have a qualified individual. Ma- make sure that the that that they're qualified on the equipment that they're testing, and they know how to do that, and they can provide you with a test report. With this and like you know, like you said, David, if you're gonna do GFPE, I mean, this is 1,200 amps, so you're gonna have to do, do have ground fault protection of equipment. You're gonna have to do your GFPE testing, and that requires primary current injection testing. So you can kill two birds with one stone. Don't hire the guy to do GFPE and then go, oh crap, I need you to go back out and do 24087. It's gonna be more expensive, two trips, hauling equipment out twice, get it all done at one time. Hey, I mean, if I need to hurry up and do that and then just tell people I'll only come out one at a time. I mean, there you go. Great. Yeah, that'd be good. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that's the testing. I don't know if there's anything else to cover there. I mean, we're two hours and 14 minutes in. We're losing that's some it? people. Man. It went fast, didn't it? Yeah. I've had a good time. I thought we've been recording this, right? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. We have been recording this. That's and it news. is what's nice about these sessions is they're live. Yep. They are going to be on YouTube. They will be on there until until years from now when we look back and we go, oh my God, get rid of that thing. Cause look, Tommy, you 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 weigh you you look huge and and oh my gosh, and, and you're gonna go, I never liked my beard, and 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 I'm gonna That's say, right. Yeah, you had these things hanging out of your ears, and That's right. and you're gonna go, your your shirt was wrinkled. And then we're going to redo this. I can't wait. I look forward to it. Yes. And we're all both old. I'll be much older than you, though. But, um, but yeah, so we did a, an extreme deep dive into 24087. I mean, we covered all of the ins and outs. We covered the voltage little trick. We covered the rating versus uh, 
adjusted to right the testing we covered uh you know, the 1200 amps the plug the adjustments the arcing current discussion that that arcing current discussion i think is the biggest hang up for someone that might not yeah. be familiar with this kind of stuff. And if you don't know, if you weren't told already, then you probably wouldn't find it unless you really start digging into IEEE 1584. Um, but hopefully someone Googles or goes on YouTube and tries to find some knuckleheads to, to explain it to him. And hopefully Tom is a knucklehead that they need. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, this is and and this is one of those uh, one of those things that that uh, get people get caught up with. They get red tagged on. Sir, I've been on inspections uh, like down with Donnie Cook down in Shelby County, Alabama, and um, you know, go up and you see a twelve hundred amp breaker, and there's no arc reduction technology. And the contractor was like, "What do I do?" Well, you got to contact the manufacturer. Yep. First, you got to figure out what is the arcing current, right? And uh, and and does the existing installation already meet it because the arcing currents are high enough? And if they are, then it's just a matter of doing some math, stamp it with a PE stamp. So get a PE to do that for you, so they know what. So the AHJ is, you know, AHJs like to see that PE stamp because it's a, it's not their responsibility. So if you're stamping it with your PE license, you own own it, right, wrong, or Congratulations, indifferent. Congratulations, you own liability. That's, yeah. right. That's right. So um, so get that PE to stamp it and say, okay, look, the existing installation is perfectly fine. But if it's not, you may have to change the breaker out. Sure. You know, it could be but, that you bought a thermal mag and it doesn't have yeah. an arc reduction maintenance switch on it. But that's what you want, right? Now, you don't want to go and, like, you know, do all the money stuff. But you want to install all this electrical equipment safely. And so if you find it, that means you found a situation where it wasn't safe to begin with. And you have found this rather than finding out it's not safe later. Yeah. And we would rather not have those consequences. Go ahead and knock this out now. Know about it now. Know about the little checklist, right? The yep. document, look it up. That's <clears throat> the whole point is why it's there. And uh, hopefully we should be able to provide some resources for you to make it so you can avoid any of the, the obstacles or speed bumps or a possible downfalls of anything yeah. like that ever come to any years. project you're working on if that breaker is 1200 amps or it can be adjusted to 1200 amps you know you got to think about 24087 yep so i mean that's a given and then you got to get the right person to look at it and to your point david you got to get it done before you start installing equipment because you got to know what what breaker to buy what trip unit to buy all that stuff I mean, if you forget about it if you don't address it after the fact, it's gonna, it's it's gonna be harder to fix the problem. That's right. So, well, we did our dirty deed. Hopefully, we um, we helped some people. Justin, thanks for joining in. Appreciate you uh, taking the time out. We had Ross Eldridge here. We had Joe Bellantoni, Steve Froming, Ro um, Robert from Omaha, Daryl Hill. We had a lot of good people online. I was happy. I'm happy to see that Al Teresi. So thanks everybody for joining us, David. I don't know if there's anything, any parting words you have for anything you need. Did we miss? Uh, you know, if anybody has any questions, uh, Tom put my email on there, but into the chat. But in case you didn't get it, it's David A. Smith at Eaton.com, E A T O N.com, just in case uh, anyone wasn't sure. And so. Yeah, please let me know if you have any code questions. That's my job, right? I'm here for you. Um, I'm kind of a customer service guy whenever it comes to that kind of stuff. So if you have any code questions and I don't understand them, I'll just go to Tom and ask him, and then we'll both learn. So it'll be Absolutely. perfect. And so if you have any questions on 24087, anything, whenever it comes to specifically residential, commercial, industrial, any of that stuff, particularly 2020 NEC, please go check out the Eaton 2020 NEC code change document. A lot of information is in there. And um, I, know, I know a lot of the people around Eaton uh, spent a lot of time on that. And so uh, check it out. Please, you know, keep in touch with Tom's LinkedIn because he does a very good job of letting you know of not only these particular streaming, but um, you know, anytime he's with any type of IEI situation, go on to my LinkedIn because I try to go 
and post anytime I'm going to virtual meetings for IEI or anything like that. Yeah. Um, who knows whenever this section meetings are be coming back, but um, some of them were, were virtual this year. And so, you know, you were able to go on either my LinkedIn or Tom's LinkedIn or something like that and um, know whenever some, I don't want to say free uh, credit hours were there, but, um, you know, you never know, right? If you get those credit hours, you're good to go and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. But um, thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, please reach out to me because that's why I'm here. Awesome. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays to everybody. Uh, please make them safe and, uh, and stay healthy. Practice that social distancing, wear your masks, all that good stuff. Uh, but enjoy your family. I mean, that's the, that's the key is you got to enjoy each other, enjoy your families, and uh, just keep it safe. And Nihad is going to be with his mother and father over in Egypt, and he's leaving on Sunday. So please be safe, Nihad, and uh, travel safely, and let us know when you get there. Beautiful. And Felix, thank you, sir. Everybody out there, thank you. Please subscribe, hit the bell. We will see you next. Wait. Next Thursday is Christmas Eve, isn't it? Are we going to do it live Christmas Eve? <laughs> oh, man. I don't know if I can. Rocking in the holidays. It's going to be like, uh, oh, like, oh, man, a rocking Christmas Eve. I don't know if uh, I can do that. Oh, man. Who is it? Who, uh, is it Dick Clark? Dick Clark. Tom Chris... Dimitrovich could be our new Dick Clark. Yeah. We well, you know what we do for Christmas Eve is um, <laughs> I make, we make pierogies. I don't you know if you know what a pierogi is. Oh, if, I mean, yes, of course. All right, okay. This is teas. So we do we do pierogies. We I make homemade pasta, uh, fettuccine noodles, regular noodles. Bobby Joe makes uh, Alfredo sauce and red sauces. Uh, we'll make all kinds of hors d'oeuvres and stuff like that. And then um, we just pick out, right? So my my father in law be over, my mother in law be over, my sister in law, etc. And we have uh, we have a nice evening that way. And um, so I'm going to be cooking. I can't go live. Wow. There's no way. Oh, sure. Well, you can make this a, a cooking channel. This will be your. <laughs> I got. You know channel. what? I got. I got to figure out a there way to go. do that. Uh, yeah. that, w- that would be funny, huh? That'd be that'd be hilarious. But I I might just go live for a few minutes just to say uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody. Very good. I like it. Christmas I like Eve. It a lot. We're definitely. I we do gonna... appreciate it. Uh, though that uh, because you know you've mentioned all that pasta and I've already told you I've gone keto until Christmas so thank you very much for making it harder for me because I'm thinking about how much I enjoy pierogies and pasta I can have none of them so far well, here's... I will be cheating for Christmas though well that's so... the thing so that, that so I've yeah. been cheating for the last week two <laughs> okay. all the yeah. way up till January and then I'm wow. going to be back on it so Atta boy good man yeah you Hold gotta back. you gotta break free sometime but I'm I think. My girlfriend and I are going to be going that three days before Christmas. We're going to do cookies and hot chocolate and all that stuff and uh, just breaking loose. And I'll probably gain all of the poundage that I've. Uh, you got to be bought. careful. Yeah. You got to yeah. be careful. But now, I was Joe. I good on Thanksgiving. But Wait, you say that again? I was even good on Thanksgiving. I was, Were you? Like, well, that's easy, though. That's a cop out. Turkey and turkey and more turkey. and some Yeah. Milk. That's no stuffing. So Joe Palantoni pointed out, oh, man, New Year's. New Year's. is Thursday. New Year's Eve is Thursday. You have, oh, so you're going to take two weeks off? No. No, 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 no. No, we're not taking two weeks off. So I just might have to do it on a different day. Oh, so you're going to, is this going to be like a pre-record? Like, are you just going to? No, I don't believe in pre I don't record. <laughs> I don't record. I, I, I can't do a, I can't, I can't record. So I think what I I'm going to end up doing. reruns. No reruns. This isn't like uh, watching uh, My Three Sons, right? So wow. I'm going to pick a different day for those days. And then um, what I want to do is I want to get, um, I want to get Russ Safried, uh, from uh, you know with the chicken switch and all that and he's with abc now i believe but um he had chicken switch before and that was his organist company uh, i'd like to get him online so i gotta figure out what days uh and then topics so maybe we can do 240 67 um i don't know maybe maybe it's like maybe we do tuesdays 
whatever you want. I mean, um, you know, I could do 240, 67. I can, the, the, the stuff that I normally do is like, geez, I've been giving residential 2020 updates for since, I mean, last year in July. So I have the slides all ready to go for that, whatever you want to do. Um, right. And then, or I could just study something new and then we can um, yeah, learn together. Yeah. Well, what a time. What a time to be alive, ladies and gentlemen. This I'm is telling you, we got man. some, I got some thinking to do. So, man. I look forward to finding out what happens. It took Joe Bellantoni to remind me it's going to be Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. So, we're going to have to figure that one out. Great. All right. Well, Mr. Smith. Tom, just think this has been a pleasure. It was, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. It's I enjoyed great. the program. I enjoyed talking with you. And, uh, we got to do it again. We do. That would be a good idea. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming on. I hope you uh, enjoy your holidays and uh, stay safe, as he said. And um, For Tom Dimitrovich, I'm David Smith, signing off. Signing off. Good night, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. And